Well, hello, everybody. My name is Garrett Schmidt, and I am the managing editor for VBC Exhibit Hall. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's live webinar uh, hosted by Calcium Health. And uh, it is titled Gamification for Value-Based Care, Behavioral Science Strategies for Healthcare Programs that Motivate Greater Patient Attendance. And I think this is a really important topic, and uh, we've got a great uh, host that's going to uh, run us through it today, which I'll mention him in a moment. A few items before we get started. Everyone's joined today on uh, listen-only mode, so you don't need to worry about muting your mic. Uh, that's been done for you. Um, also, during the webinar, uh, we want to hear from you. So please, if you have a question, please ask it at any time. You have a, uh, a module that has a little question feature that you can ask there. So it's not the chat, it's the little question feature. And um, we would love to hear your questions. You don't have to wait till the Q&A session at the end in order to ask. So go ahead and ask at any time. We'll get to as many as we can. If we can't get to yours today for some reason, uh, we'll definitely follow up with the email afterwards. So please, uh, we wanna hear from you. And then finally, today's session is being recorded. And so what we're gonna do is after the session, I'm gonna send out a, a link uh, probably in, in several hours uh, out to everyone who's registered. And you'll be able to follow that link and see where the recording is, and then also download the slides as well. That way you can share it with colleagues or rewatch it if you would like. We hope that you do. Uh, without further ado, I wanted to introduce our presenter today, Mr. Ray Villar. And he is the digital architect with Calcium Health, and he's going to get us kicked off. So welcome, Ray. Thank you so much, Garrett. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining us today. I um, hope you'll find this uh, as uh, informative and rewarding as I find it exciting. I, I've been involved with gamification for almost a decade now. Uh, it's something very close to me. And, you know, when I eventually get back to, uh, to grad school or actually for my doctorate, this is actually uh, my plan is to get my, uh, some, uh, do some advanced research on, on this area more than what I've already been doing. But again, thank you very much for coming on board. And let's go ahead and get started. Uh, a little bit, a bit about me, I am um, the digital architect at Calcium, uh, formerly called Health Champion. Uh, we, we changed our name last year. Uh, I am an adjunct professor at University of Wisconsin Stout, where I got my master's degree uh, a, a, few, a, few, uh, a few years ago, let's just say. Uh, and I've been uh, a serial entrepreneur, uh, and I'm kind of proud to say I was part of the co-founding co team here at Calcium. Really excited about what, what we're doing here. Um, and we founded this uh, just four years ago now, and we're very excited um, um, with this. And, and one about the excitement, that, one of the reasons I'm so excited too is that you know we're also really implementing um, a lot of the gamification and behavioral science uh, strategies that I've all, I've always been passionate about and researching, among other things. So thank you for, uh, for joining me and let's dive into it. And I, I wanna start out by this, uh, with the simple truth, I mean, whether you like it or not, whether we like it or not, we're getting gamified all the time. Today. Even if you don't use any apps, by the way, even if you, you, know, you don't spend much time on computers or, uh, or anything else, we're being gamified today because gamification is everywhere. And gamification is already motivating everyone, you know, most everyone in the U.S., including us. Um, and just to give you some, uh, some examples, um, well, first of all, gamification is part of behavioral sciences, which has been a field of study for over 100 years. Uh, and of course, it really started taking off in the early days, in the early days of marketing. Uh, oh, I don't know what happened, but uh, it looks like my screen sharing is paused. Let me uh, um, turn this off. Um, Sorry about that. Let me read. Got to make sure I don't get interrupted anymore. I apologize for that. Um, That's what happens when we do it live, folks? Yeah, yeah. I still get uh, messages popped up, and I got to make sure to turn those off. Um, but anyway, with the rise of our, um, if you guys can see, can can you see see this now? Uh, I believe. Uh, right. But with the rise of our app economy, gamification has really taken off. Um, you know, gamification is kind of place in many fields, gaming, shopping, you know, with, with employment uh, and students. And, and it's been around for ages, but it's really coming to the forefront today. Uh, I know, you know, I, as part of my research, but at least that's what I like to claim, I really jumped into gaming, you know, online um, poker, for example, and different, you know, role playing games online, strategy games online. And, and you'd be amazed how much gamification 
application, you know, it gets into there. Um, you know, um, uh, it's, it's involved in that. Uh, and again, I apologize, um, you know, uh, with that. I'm actually turning off. Um, uh, let me uh, continue yeah. with this. Let's I'll tell you what, uh, Ray. Well, yeah, why don't you stop your share and then? Um, yeah, when I do that, I'll pause that, and I'm going to turn off some a few, you know, that my Microsoft Teams. Which seems uh, to be, bear with us, folks. Yeah. All right. Hopefully that does it. All right. So, uh, so get, getting back to this, gamification is already motiv motivating many uh, people in many industries. Uh, and it's well established. I mean, uh, shopping and loyalty rewards, whether you like it or not, you know, those loyalty rewards, those frequent user, frequent fire um, programs are forms of gamification. You know, my wife and I use hotels.com, you know, uh, regularly for all of our reservations or whenever we can as much as possible because every 10, you know, 10 nights we, you know, we reserve to get through hotels.com, we get a free night. You know, similarly with you know the airlines, uh, we, you know, we, we gravitate towards uh, Southwest and American Airlines not only because they're you know they have a lot more flights for us locally, but because we're also able to get flyer mileage. Uh, employees, you um, most of us have been involved with this. Bonuses really are, are a form of gamification, but even employee of the month and unlimited uh, paid time offs. I actually was at a company that rolled out unlimited PTOs. And here's the neat thing about that, that, and I'll come back to as we go through this gamification, whether whether it's employees or customers or patients, doesn't always have to cost anything. I mean, employee of the month, how much does it cost you know, uh, to, to have an employee of the month program? Nothing, unless you actually reward uh, a cash bonus for that employee. Unlimited paid time off. I know a lot of startup, startups have rolled this out. You know, and you know, and, and the gist of it is that you can take time off whenever you want as long as your work is done. Well, of course, the, the flip side of that is they never have to worry about you know paying for you know um, unused uh, vacation days or unused sick days when when an employee leaves. Um, but really, where gamification the industry where gamification is really taken off or is starting to take off tremendously is uh, is in education. Um, but gamification has been around too in, in, in education for as long as I remember. I remember as kids we would get stars and medals and you know that would be a big driver for us. You know, or, or today, you know, certificates and game time rewards. Uh, I remember, you know, a, a couple of years ago, my daughter came home with this great certificate of most improved student in, you know, in, in, in reading. And she just loved it and it, it just motivated her to do more reading. You know, um, um, you know, so we're always seeing gamification everywhere. And that kind of begs the question, you know, you know, gamification is all about driving, you know, engagement uh, um, and, and empowerment and, and, and more action. But where is it in healthcare? I mean, if there's any industry that needs gamification to drive greater adherence, greater engagement, greater, you know, performance and, and you know, and, and really sticking to uh, treatment we need it more than any other industry. Now, what I want to do today is really kind of talk, uh, kind of explain what gamification is and, and, and give some real life examples on how we can use it and how it's being used uh, uh, both in healthcare and outside, and also prepare you to begin initial steps to gamification uh, with, your, uh, with your regular programs that you have right now. You know, to start with, gamification is about game game mechanics. It's, it's not game theory. You know, I actually had a discussion about that with an employee who thought gamification was game theory, and I had to explain game theory, which most of you have probably heard of, is about how to win a competition against one or two more you know rivals or opponents. Gamification is not gamification. Uh, it, it is actually more about UX and design that's intended to elicit a specific behavior. Now, there are some overlap with game, uh, game theory, but, you, but gamification is not just games and it's not just about games. It's about designing programs, designing user experience elements that, that motivate your users, your customers, your patients to act a certain way or to adopt a certain, um, uh, a certain um, uh, lifestyle. Um, now, Obviously, there's some ethics questions in here that some of you may already be wondering about, and we will address that later. 
Okay, but I do just want to, you know, try to start with that. Now, with that, you know, I do have to tell you, as, as wonderful as gamification is, as proven, uh, uh, as, as many, as much proof as there is that gamification does work, a lot of gamification programs fail. And often it, it fails because of this lack of understanding about gamification that some people think it's just about creating games or contests. It's not. Gamification actually is about having a, a, a particular behavior or lifestyle change that you want a user or a patient to adopt and then designing more, you know, uh, engagement tools and gamification uh, devices to get them to adopt that. And here's the thing, you know, as we really get into how do you, how do you actually apply gamification in your programs, you know, at, at your facility, you know, at your, uh, uh, at your place, at your a convo care organization or your value value based care organization. Uh, that's what, what I want to start jumping into now. I, I want to start by by kind of going by by just explaining right away that one size doesn't fit all. You know, one type of of gamification program is not necessarily gonna cover everybody. I mean, frequent flyer models, they don't get all the flyers for an airline, that an airline has. It's only a select few, you know, anywhere from, you know, seven to 20% of people who fly United Airlines actually have a United Airlines frequent flyer uh, model, are part of United Airlines frequent flyer mileage program. Um, and similarly, you know, not everybody, you know, um, is involved with you know what what will we'll get involved with whatever gamification program uh, you actually set up. So you actually need to have different programs that appeal to different gamification personas. Now, and and that's really uh, you know one of the key things to having a successful gamification program is to understand that there are many different personalities uh, of of patients and people out there. Some people don't need any prodding. You know, some of your patients don't need gamification because they understand the seriousness of their hypertension diagnosis or their diabetes diagnosis, diagnosis or whatever you know the you know the condition, and they're totally committed to addressing it. But for everybody else, and there's a lot of both everybody else that have a difficult time staying on track. That's where gamification really helps you move the needle. Okay, whether it's you know tackling the obesity crisis in your community or or the spike in, in you know, um, heart disease cases in your, uh, in your service, service area. Gamification helps, uh, it succeeds when you first understand that there are, you know, there are different personas, as we like to call them, um, that you're going to need to look at and consider which ones you want to design for. And, and by the way, individuals have different overlapping personas, as we'll talk about. But in gamification, you know, one of the most popular models uh, was put out by uh, Andres, I'm going to butcher this name, but uh, Andres uh, Mar Marsuski. Uh, and he kind of put together a model with six gamification personas, socializers, free spirits, achievers, philanthropists, players, and disruptors. You know, successful gamification design means understanding, uh, means understanding and prioritizing patient personas to to figure out what will um, what will uh, what kind of gamification strategy will motivate a, a particular patient persona to do something uh, to make a adopt a lifestyle or a healthy lifestyle change that you feel is needed. Okay, and now you know. Let's jump, drive into the dive into this. So the first one I want to talk about is socialize. And with all of this, you'll notice I, I actually am going to give you a um, talk about the motivation for that persona their wants, uh, a recommended approach, and some examples. Okay, so the first one is socializers. And by the way, this is probably one of, going to be one of the easiest in, in many ways, but also somewhat challenging when it comes to privacy and uh, privacy issues. Um, but, uh, but socializers, and, and by the way, most of you may see parts of yourself in, in a couple, two or three or more of these, um, uh, most, more, more of these personas. But more but the motivation for socializers is they want to, they have an, um, a need to, uh, to be related and, and be part of the community. And, and you, yes, you could say that everybody has, has that to some level or, or, or another, but socializers really do have that high level of, um, of need for this, you know, 
for community and relatedness. And you know, they tend to want to interact with others and create uh, social interactions with others. They, they feed off of that. They get energized by that. And so the approach for socializers uh, in your community, again, whether you're a business trying to uh, uh, you know, get more regular repeat users or you're uh, an ACO trying to get um, you know, targeted populations to, uh, to engage more, to, to, for, uh, to really stay on the path for whatever their chronic condition uh, challenge may be or health challenge may be, is they encourage group activities uh, and social learning and knowledge sharing. And as I said about these socializers, they don't want just to talk. They want to be part of a group and they also want to share with that group. Okay. And so some examples of this is, you know, it's a moderated social media group, for example, for your hypertensive patients. You know, moderated by that is, you know, you can set it up a simple one in Facebook, for example, uh, or uh, Instagram, however you want to do it with, you know, and have um, one of somebody from your team, either a nurse or uh, a clinical, you know, a, a clinician, just, you know, moderate discussions for an hour a day or a few times a week, but also answer questions as, as, as they come in on, you know, uh, during the day. Uh, and then encourage those group discussions within that. Uh, another one is, you know, is in-person meetups for like, let's say you have type 2 diabetic patients and you, you can encourage in-person meetups, you know, to have them come to your conference room, you know, on, on a weekend, on a weekday. Oop, I didn't realize that uh, I got interrupted again. Um, sorry about that. Um, okay, hopefully you guys can see me now. Oh. Gotcha. Okay, so in-person meetups for you know for type two diabetic patients, um, and, you know, and it can be for any kind of condition, but allowing them to really get in there, get you know, get involved with others, uh, is a great way to motivate socializers. And you know, a, a real life example of this is, is Weight Watchers. And I have to admit, I've been involved with Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers. And if any of you have been in, in, in Weight Watchers, you know that those regular meetings are a big part of their program. Because, you know, and, 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 and by the way, Weight Watchers has tons of gamification built in into their program. But one of them is that social element where people come in and give, to, give each, each other mutual support and especially celebrate the wins. And again, for these personas, it doesn't cost a lot, but you can really uh, create some programs or, 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 um, or roll out or expand some programs specifically for these persona types among your patients to get them more involved. Now, the next, uh, the the second group that uh, uh, you know in that um, uh, in in Marsuski's list of six are, are free spirits. You know, with these individuals, and kind of a big part of me is in there. Is in, I feel I find myself really, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, connecting with this group. Is uh, it's a motivation for autonomy and discovery, and especially to create through exploration new things and discover new things on my own and, and to kind of build through it and, and use that to build things, um, to build different you know, relationships or programs or, or, or even communities. You know, so you know, the approach to these individuals is to provide opportunities for learning and allow patients to develop their own care plans or, or give them a, a, a more input into how they structure their care and treatment plans. You know, some examples of this, uh, you know, um, uh, and I have, we have, you know, um, we've been working on a pathway uh, for asthma patients where they can learn about their allergies and then develop their own allergy action plan. Because, you know, you do want allergy patients to have an allergy action plan, but oftentimes it's just, you know, they don't do it themselves. They wait for somebody to give it to them. In this case, with the free spirit, this is a great opportunity for them to actually learn more about it and then develop an action plan that fits them. You know, another easy one too is personalization options, especially on digital platforms. You know, if you have apps or anything else for your patients um, or any users for, for that app user for that matter, having that ability to personalize is an you know, is another element uh, for uh, free spirits. And along with that, to other tools that you'll find in other apps, whether it's gaming or uh, or education app, are Easter eggs and trivia. Free spirits again, it, it feeds into that desire for discovery and then creating new things and sharing. The third, uh, uh, the third group are achievers. Okay. Now, uh, achievers uh, in many ways are, 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 are your 
are your stereotypical gaming or, or competitive people. But here's the thing about them. Um, they're, you know, they're in their, um, their primary motivation is to get recognized because they've mastered a subject or a skill. And their desire is they want self-improvement and to overcome challenges, but they also, you know, really like the recognition that comes from, uh, you know, from realizing that, you know, their, their ability to overcome those challenges. You know, and so, um, so a common approach uh, to this achiever persona and gamification is to encourage competitive spirit with rewards and mentions and badges. You know, as I mentioned before, you know, that was, you know, my, my daughter coming home a couple of years ago with that certificate for best improved in reading. She loved that. Now she's, you know, uh, and, and we were always worried about her, you know, her, her reading skills, um, you know, and that was really a great motivator for her. And that, you know, that, that simple reward. And, and I also remember, you know, when I was in grade school, you know, how, you know, those little stars would be a big motivator for us, you know, if, once we mastered a skill or a subject. So that, those are common examples uh, of uh, strategies and approaches and tactics for that achiever persona and gamification, certificates and badges for achievements, not just to give them away just for participation. You know, these particular achievers are actually going to look negatively if you just give away badges just for people participating. You know, they want specific, you know, a special badge for actually reaching, a, you know, overcoming a challenge. Uh, so that achievement actually means requiring to do extra effort. Also award points or coins for, uh, for pathway milestones. Um, and, and here's a big thing that, that we've actually found out at counseling is leaderboards for steps taken. BMI improvement, you know, within a specific period, those kind of um, you know, leaderboards, especially, are really big motivators for achievers and also other uh, competitors as well, uh, more competitive spirits. Now, the next one that I want to talk about are philanthropists. These are a little bit rarer. Okay, with philanthropists, you know, the the the, the motivation for philanthropists and gamification is, is a is need for meaning and purpose. They want to have a purpose. They, you know, they, they want to make sure that what they're doing or what they choose to do and, and talk about or, or, or invest themselves in has meaning or give, either gives, their, gives them meaning or gives others meanings. And so their desire here is to be altruistic and really help other people. Um, so how do you, what's the uh, strategic approach here in gamification for philanthropists? Well, the primary one is to promote opportunities for these philanthropists to be philanthropists to be volunteer leaders and sharers for specific health challenges. So, for example, if you you know, and, and by the way, to to let them know that these opportunities are available. So, you know, a common example is a, a COPD patient advisory board of of your patients who have had COPD for a while and have been doing really well at, at you know at, at staying on top you know of, of, of managing that that uh, chronic condition. Uh, again, whether it's COPD or chronic heart disease or diabetes or hypertension, whatever this case may be, you know, uh, giving them an opportunity to actually share and provide their feedback um, with each other, but but also with the team, you know, with your care, with their caregivers, uh, is, is an important um, uh, is an important opportunity and, and and drive for philanthropists. Also, if you're working on if you have apps, uh, vendor apps and solutions and platforms. These, you know, patient advisory reports are a great way for, you know, for these philanthropists to, again, you know, give more meaning to what they're doing. Now, obviously, staying on, on, you know, on whatever care management plan they're on or treatment plan they're on helps them. It helps their health. But for philanthropists, that philanthropist persona, that opportunity to actually do more, to actually, you know, allow them to help others through their own, with their own experiences and with their feedback, is a powerful tool, a powerful, powerful motivator. You know, and along those same lines, you could award a special patient expert badges as learning certificates, uh, but also training for, uh, you know, for community health volunteers. These are where, you know, these philanthropist personas really fit in. This is where they're really, where they're really driven. Now, the fifth, uh, the fifth group are what I call players. And, you know, and for players, motivation is how many awards, how many prizes, how many coins, you know, can I, can I collect? Now, you may be tempted to think that players are shallow or or mo motivated by just you know some shiny object. They're not, and that well, 
not all, but anyway, um, you know, and, and that would be a mistake, though, because players are, have a deeper um, kind of motivation beyond just awards and prizes. For, for them, you know, they, they do want to collect as many rewards for themselves and their family, but there's also the reasoning behind that desire to collect is not just those things, it's what those things could potentially allow them, you know, uh, what, what doors or opportunities those awards and prizes can open for them. Okay, and so the approach for players is to have a reward system with clear messaging for what you can win in the prizes, but to really motivate these, you know, uh, these players, um, you know, because that, you know, these players are oftentimes always looking for more uh, awards and prizes, but that's not enough. They want something that that can actually be uh, not just not not just a reward, but actually provide a useful benefit for them. So just some common examples for this are. Let's, you know, having reward credits, you know, for gift certificates for a local massage therapist or spa or a gym, or, or having healthy prices such as a, a, you know, exercise bike or, you know, other exercise machine, you know, for, for top players or for certain contests. And along the way, you know, you know, whatever that, that, you know, that challenge is, gets them to better health as well. Um, but players, you know, yes, coins, you know, your digital coins and, uh, other tokens and, and simple awards and prizes are big, but for them, it's you know what else you know what is the you know what are the, how can those prizes and awards uh, awards really benefit them? Now the the last group is an interesting group, I, you know, and I see part of my stuff in, in in here as well. And these are disruptors, you know, disruptors. Uh, the motivation for disruptors are change and innovation. You know, they want to disrupt the, the status quo. To Fix serious problems. You know, whenever they see a problem, they want to, you know, to really uh, solve it. Uh, or if they see a, a problem that nobody else sees, or they see, you know, or they they experience problems with a system, you know, disruptors oftentimes want to break that system in order to encourage change and innovation. You know, so how do you harness these disruptors? What's the, the strategic approach? The primary one is to encourage them to give their feedback. And, act, and, and, and give action on their feedback uh, and suggestions. You know, um, you know one, one opportunity is to, you know, allow them to rate all the content, content and tools you provide. You know, not just give you a satisfaction ratings, which obviously a, a lot of, you know, uh, this, this out, that is a big motivator you know, for a lot of providers, but really give them more opportunities to provide feedback on, you know, articles that you provide or tools that you provide, whether or not they really are, you know, all, you know, they, they work as they're supposed to, or they actually really help. You know, another one is to allow, allow them to submit ideas for patient engagement and care, and then, you know, then open up for voting on those submitted ideas. This is actually commonplace in the you know, business SaaS world. So uh, I use HubSpot, which is a very uh, popular marketing tool and also Salesforce. And other tools like that today have community forums where users can submit new features or feature fixes that you know that they they want to see work on, and then the community votes on them. Votes on them. So like HubSpot, one of my favorite tools, every month they come up with a list of the the high the the, the feature suggestions that get the most votes, and they start working on the top three. You know if you know if they can. Uh, sometimes it's not available, but they're not able to, but the, the top three that they can work on, they commit to working on that the next month. And so, you know, that's also another, you know, another tool. It, it doesn't cost a lot to, to set up this survey and then ask people to vote on this, but it gives disruptors, you know, that, you know, that it tells them, yeah, your, your suggestions count and we want to, you know, we're acting on it. And the other thing too is give disruptors the challenge to break apps and tools you're, you're considering. You know, so if you're looking at, at testing a new program or a new vendor, you know, one way to really make sure it works is to harm, you know, is to get these disruptors to try to break it. And this is commonplace, by the way, in the app world. You know, in the app world, whenever you're creating app, you know, we, you know, the, the mantra with a lot of app developers, especially in um, in Silicon Valley, but, but really nationwide globally is get it out there and, and, and you know, and ask uh, potential users or early adopters to break it. That's what disruptors do. 
and you know some people might might look askew at them because they you know they do want to break you know break things but really they want to break it for a purpose of action of fixing something that should be working but isn't so how how, how do you know which persona to use for a patient you know, this is a common question I've run into. Is like, all right, that's great. Those are great personas, but how do you know which persona, you know, what persona a patient has? You know, well, number one, you could ask. You know, you could, you know, you could present, you know, uh, your you know, different program ideas or different programs you might have, and say which one, you know, appeals to you. And by you can tell, you can pretty much figure out what the persona is, you know, by by allowing them to self select. But also, you know the a th you know, another answer to this question is it doesn't really matter you know you know recognize that most of us have at least two or more gamification personas you know at, at play within us and that we're not, I'm not saying we have split person personalities but we have in this gamification you know um, uh, uh, approach we have different motivations and with that you know you know as we start you know rolling out these programs and look at addressing these different gam these different personas to hit a goal, okay, uh, and that really is the way to do it. And, and I want to give up. I want to present this case study of Duolingo. Some of you might actually be using Duolingo today. It's one of the most popular language learning tools in the world. And I got, I had, the, I had the, a great opportunity to meet one of the uh, co-founders uh, at a conference about three years ago, and he was giving a presentation, and I talked, uh, spent some time talking to him afterwards about gamification and the thing about Duolingo is they embraced gamification from the very beginning but he pointed you know he made this, uh, this great he gave a great example of how gamification works best if you use it if you have a clearly identified challenge or problem you want to address with your users okay so in the case of Duolingo one of the things about language learning as any of you have ever tried to learn a language and keep a, a second language is that if you don't practice it regularly, you start to lose it. I mean, I was born um, in the Philippines, immigrated here to, you know, in the U.S. to Chicago when I was five years old, and I spoke, you know, uh, uh, Tagalog, um, my native, you know, my Filipino main language, official language, you know, for the, you know, all through grade school, I was bilingual. You know, I was English and 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 Filipino and Tagalog, but as I spoke it less and less, and I, you know, went off to high school and college. Um, and grew up and, you know, I really didn't speak it, even with my, the, the Filipino friends I had with them who never spoke it, I lost it. I, I can barely, uh, I can't speak it now and I can barely understand it when it's spoken to me by my parents. Uh, and, and, and Duolingo understood that the importance of daily practice for learning a language. And so that was a challenge. How do you get people to learn a language and, and, and commit to learning a language by, by practicing every day? So the first thing they did is make sure that they could practice it every day by breaking down those language lessons to five to 10 minute daily exercises. Now you can do multiple exercises in a day, but you can, you know, if you could just do one five minute or 10 minute exercise a day, that's it. You know, you, you, hit, the, you hit this, uh, this you, know, you break through this obstacle. The next thing though is how do you get people to keep coming back every day to do those daily exercises? So what Duolingo did was, they actually created a, a program where they track, you know, how many days straight you went, you, know, you went in and actually did an exercise. And then, you know, and then gave rewards based on how many, you know, days or weeks, or even months in a row you you attended. Um, now they ran into they, they ran into a little bit of crisis though because people really racked up, you know, long tenures, and then when they accidentally broke their streak because you know you know they forgot or they were sick or they somehow got, you know, totally, you know, uh, totally um, booked at work or whatever. They got distraught and, you know, and they asked Duolingo, hey, you know, I don't, you know, I don't like, you know, it's not fair that I'm not, you know, my street, you know, count broke you know, just because it wasn't, it wasn't my fault. And so what did Duolingo do? They actually gave users the opportunity to restore broken streaks. So they basically got, got three days. Um, that they can put in and, and continue their streak, even if they, you know, if they miss the day, but only if you paid for it, you know, if you actually had, you were a paid subscriber. So here's the crazy thing. So not only 
did um, Duolingo you know, solve that challenge of getting their users to, to log on and, and do an exercise every single day? They actually got the users to pay them more money. They actually generated more revenue in the process you know, to get those people who missed the day, for those people who missed the day. And it didn't really cost them anything. It was a simple programming patch, you know, that they, you know, they, they rolled out in a day and that actually generated more revenue for them. And then, you know, what I found in my own research is that other gaming, you know, other games, for example, and um, um, especially you know, app games do the same thing. So like Zynga Poker, um, and I, I use online poker there, um, I play that occasionally is that, you know, every day you come on board is that, you, you know, you can get free chips and, you know, by doing this, um, pulling on this, this slot machine, uh, digital slot machine. And actually, if you've been there seven straight days, they'll quadruple or, you know, multiply whatever you win, you know, those slot machines, how many, ever many chips those slot machines give you by, by 4X. Uh, and then, you know, other games like Art of War and others like that um, have tournaments that you know that give you you know some special prizes but it's difficult to win rewards if you miss a day you know they're only one or two week you know uh, contests but you have to be there every single day and so those are built-in motivators to try to get people to come back on a regular basis you know at calcium uh, our approach is you know, we've always taken a consumer-centric approach and, and a kind of outside in uh, approach with our you know um, a concept of health universe and health index. Well, what, one of the tools that we've done are leaderboards and achievement badges. And we've found a lot, we, we see an increasing engagement when we do that with, with, the, with the programs that, the, that use that. Um, and then on top of that, while we encourage people to get you know, involved with these challenges, we also use that opportunity to get them to take advantage of our other tools whether it's our medication management, secure sharing, and, or AI health assessment tools. Um, and just to kind of give you an example of this is that, you know, every month we roll out a new challenge. You know, and we started this very early on when we first started really beta testing our app. And we got people uh, um, really, you know, uh, to sign up and be part of the challenge. But then we started having a leader, then we added a leaderboard. And when we added our leaderboard, we saw uh, not just the number of people signed up, but keep signing up and get really engaged. You know, in, in the, the, the level of uh, engagement really increased because people started looking at those leaderboards. And, and that's when they're, you know, especially for the players and the achievers, that's when their competitive spirits really kicked in and wanting to be on the top of those leaderboards, whether it's doing squats every day or, you know, or doing, you know, getting, you know, putting in more steps each day or climbing more stairs. Now, another case study I want to talk about is called Healthy Wage. Uh, I actually, you know, tried this out about three, three years ago now. And it's an interesting concept. You may have heard about them. And that is you pay like anywhere from 50 to to $100. Uh, it's a bet that you'll achieve a reasonable weight loss and they have a calculator that will help you in a specific period. And if you hit your goal, you know, for your 50 or $100, you'll get back anywhere from 300 to 1300 sometimes more if you succeed. And, and it doesn't work for some. You know, um, the, the, the con of this program, the, 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 the anti-pro, might be a better word, is that they actually offer little support behind that this, this gamification of, uh, of trying to motivate you to uh, motivate players, especially, to win more money. And there's also a, a, a reality here. You know, if you think about it, the reason they're able to give such high, you know, um, rewards, you know, if, if you do make it, is because other people fail. And there's a high fail rate. You know, um, you know, so that's the reality of of of, uh, of apps like this. And the great fail on this is that the focus is on the outcome, not on the behavioral change. And and any of you who are clinicians and providers here probably really understand that concern is that it's not just about losing weight in a certain amount of time. It's about adopt, you know, especially for most of our patients with chronic conditions, it's about adopting behavioral changes for life, you know, not just for a certain amount of period and then get all those weight back, and, you know, put all that, those weight back or, or, you know, or bounce off and, you know, 
fall off the wagon and go back to the, the old habits that got you there in the first place. Um, now, in this slide, I do have this matrix you know, kind of summarized. You know, what are some uh, examples of gaming app strategies? I, I won't go through, uh, through here, but these are typically, you know, looking at gaming apps in particular, not healthcare apps. These are common tools to really uh, additional strategies to, um, to motivate these personas. Um, but you know, you know when you you know we'll have this available on our um, you know, BBC uh, exhibit hall uh, booth, so please uh, check it out when you have a chance uh, later this week. Now I do you know as I start closing out, I do want to talk about the ethics of gamification because yes, gamification is manipulative, just like this photo of cat of this cat and any you know video of cat it kind of manipulates your emotions, you know. So the challenge. It, the, the problem is that it's manipulative. You know, the challenge is how do we keep it ethical? Okay. And, I, and I actually have three rules, you know, that I always um, uh, I always go by and, and, and promote when talking about gamification with different groups. And the first is alignment. Your gamification strategy has to be aligned with the state of objective of your program, okay, and, and nothing else, okay. And, and I'll give you a, a, a clear um, a, a clear um, uh, a bright line here. If your gamification strategy is to encourage higher, you know, um, customer you know, patient satisfaction ratings, that is not alignment. Okay, that's marketing, uh, and that's that's you know that's manipulation to make you you know to get you better you know uh, positioning or more rev you know more uh, uh, rewards or, you know from you know from uh, you know from um, from Medicare from CMS or other organizations. Alignment means your gamification strategy has to be aligned with a stated objective or a clear objective of improving your patient's health, not improving your patient satisfaction ratings. You will get higher patient satisfaction ratings, you know, as you improve their health, but that should not be, you know, your, your goal, your objective should be their health. And also be transparent, be upfront with the purpose of your, of your program, whether it's a co competition or tournament, or, or, or badges or rewards, it's really to encourage your patients uh, to, to adopt long-term behavioral change that will make, that will improve, you know, in health outcomes and really improve their health, okay? And, and not try to sell anything else. And it's okay to be that transparent. It's okay to, to admit, hey, we want, we have this program because we want to help you get better. You know, um, we, we, we know that this is how, you know, how we, you know, take care of your diabetes. And then lastly, again, it kind of goes back to number one is the patient health has to be your primary focus first and foremost. That is how we keep gamification in healthcare ethical. Right? We're not trying to solve anything else. We're not trying to get higher uh, patient satisfaction rating, although that's always in the, you know, the back of my mind for, for many people. You know, we're not trying to uh, use this necessarily to, to lower uh, readmittance rate, although we do want that. But really, it's you know the primary focus has to be on on patient's health, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but I do feel that this is something I, I feel strongly about. I, you know, my my as you saw in my bio sheet, I, you know, my my uh, bachelor, my undergrad degree was in philosophy, so um, you know, so I've always had this in the back of my mind uh, whenever I design programs. So as we get started, you gotta understand that gamification doesn't need to. You can start small and keep building, but in healthcare, with our many challenges, you know, um, you know to, to improve population health, we just have to get started. Gamification is not going to solve everything, but it's a powerful tool that's already proven itself in other industries. We need it in healthcare. Um, and but the key thing is we just need to get started, we can start small and keep building. Now, uh, before we get into the Q&A, I do want to talk about, uh, you know, a little bit about calcium. You know, we've been working on this for over three years now, almost four, really building a consumer-centric uh, app, but integrated with the dashboard for providers to get, you know, a great, you know, to engage people and enab enable better health decisions. Really, in a nutshell, to empower patients to take control of their health uh, and work in, in greater collaboration uh, with their providers. And so one of the things that we do want to offer to uh, you know, uh, our participants here, but uh, all the uh, DBC uh, exhibit hall subscribers is uh, a special program because we are trying to get uh, more pilots involved and 
uh, we are going to waive our setup fee, you know, for uh, BBC um, subscribers and offer a flat rate program instead of, um, um, you know, per user per month. Uh, and even then, you know, with a flat, with a per user per month, we're, we're offering a discounted rate. Um, we're going to send out an email to everybody about this to get more information. But if you want to learn more about this, please just send me an email and look forward to um, uh, to talk more about it with all of you. Um, we're not offering this uh, to anybody else, but we're really happy and and, and glad uh, with our relationship with uh, BBC uh, Exhibit Hall, and just kind of wanted to uh, you know return the favor. And with that, let's go ahead and kick uh, and turn it over to Garrett with our Q and A. All right. Well, well, thanks, Ray, and that's a generous offer. And if you're interested in that, let let me know or let Ray know, and uh, happy to connect you. Uh, okay, we did have a few questions that did that came in in no particular order. And if you have one, go ahead and ask it, and I'll get to as many as I can here. Um, again, no particular order. Uh, first question is, how do we teach our staff to apply this? Good question. Um, you know, it's you know part of it is watch the video. It's going to be available in the BBC exhibit hall booth. Uh, it's probably a good place to start. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm sort of an evangelist for gamification in healthcare, uh, somewhat self-appointed. So, you know, definitely, you know, I would love to, if you, if you want to reach out to me, you have my email address, you have my LinkedIn profile. I can even jump on a call, time available, you know, time for, uh, allowing. But really, it is um, about uh, kind of talking about, you know, what we talked about here today is that start small, start with a purpose, and just work on one thing, uh, work on one thing. Let's say it's, you know, let's say the, the big issue in your community, for example, might be hypertension. And you're not alone on, you know, with that, by the way. You know, create a program for your hypertension patients, you know, and, you know, just for them and to see, you know, how would, you know, how would that, um, you know, how can you use gamification for, uh, let's say for the socializers, um, the, your, your hypertension patients who are socializers. Start with that. Just create an, an online uh, community just for hypertension, and have one of your, you know, staff members uh, moderate it once a day. That's, it's, it's that simple. Start start small, and then just build on it, and then look at another persona that you want to tackle that you, you see regularly. Um, and and that's probably and and talk to your providers and talk to your staff to see what kind of personas they see, and you know, build to that. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that, that does help. And, and actually, this kind of tags along with that question is, which persona should we prioritize? Well, <laughs> um, I would say, you know, go with the one that you that you feel in your, you know, in your population is the most prevalent, uh, especially with a particular condition or problem you want to, want to assess. And then the other part, which was easiest, you know, look, if you don't have much of a budget and you don't have a lot of time, yeah, putting together a Facebook social media group, private though, so you invite people, invite only patients to that, not, you know, make it uh, general to everybody, although you could if you wanted to, uh, and have just, you know, find um, a staff member trained in, in, in hypertension who can kind of moderate it just once a day during the week. And it's that, you know, it starts simple. Cool. Uh, all right. Next, uh, next question is: uh, Don't people eventually get tired of the same contests or challenges? Yeah. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Uh, so you, and that's where you do need to change it up. Okay. Now, uh, the different gaming platforms that I've tried out, what they often do is they'll, they'll have seasonal things. So every month they have a new program. Mm -hmm. So you changes it up, you know, by you know scheduling. So like Zynga Poker, every February <laughs> they have a Valentine's Day. Uh, every March, they have a St. Patrick's Day kind of uh, event. And, and again, it's just a brief tournaments and stuff. Uh, but yeah, you want to kind of change it up on a regular basis. Um, you know, um, again, you don't have to change everything. Uh, but if you do special, turn, you know, if you do special events, special challenges, you know, make it appropriate for a season you know, kind of thing. You know, one, you know, one thing that I've seen that I really, uh, really like, for example, is that couch to 5k uh, program some of you may have actually mm -hmm. seen that. that's actually a great challenge and the best time to start that often you know at least here in the north uh, where i'm at is oftentimes in january or february right at the beginning of the year that gives you it gives patients enough time to really build up to run a 5k by early summer 
Great. Uh, next question, moving right along. Uh, what is the best way or how do we keep track of, of these participants and awards and such? Yeah, the simplest way is with a spreadsheet, but it's time consuming. And so I would recommend, you know, some sort of app. I know uh, Shameless Club, yes, Health Champion, I mean, uh, Calcium does that. Um, mm -hmm. We actually have pathways. You can design your own, you know, um, uh, pathway where there's to you know encourage people to read up on uh, read up, uh, and, and view a number of articles or or videos about their hypertension um, um, you know diagnoses or whatever the case may be and then you know track how many actually did it uh, but yeah simple way is just with a simple spreadsheet but as it grows you'll want to find a way to actually you know automate this as much as possible cool um, okay next question is uh, without naming the organization or the, an organization, can you share any examples of health systems that have applied this principle and demonstrated a measurable outcome with the population? Yeah, we actually did a, I'm not gonna attempt, I'm actually legally bound not to right. name <laughs> It's a large organization. Um, and we were, the, the, our, our primary contact, and contact there is actually finishing up a, a paper that's being published uh, next month, I believe, or yeah, next month in May, yeah. So, and that one was a diabetes uh, program where uh, we actually, you know, the goal of that diabetes program was to get diabetes patients to start using it and to lower the A1C. And uh, it was only, uh, uh, I want to say it's like a four or five week program, or maybe, yeah, was, I think it was a four week program. And we, you know, work with them, you know, they used our pathway kind of platform to build up a pathway of regular activities and checks uh, during that period. And at the end of it, uh, they had a few hundred users, I believe. Uh, they saw, um, you know, an average uh, drop of about 1.7% in A1C um, scores. Um, stay tuned on that. We'll probably put a, a notice on our VBC exhibit hall booth next month. Uh, but that's, you know, that's one, you know, I think a really big example. And we actually have detailed, you know, data uh, that's going to be published in an academic journal. Um, next month, it's you know we finished that up. We wrapped it up last month, and they're going through the final peer review and and data checks now. Uh, so we're excited to, to talk about that uh, next month. Oh cool. yeah, stay tuned, everybody. Um, yep. And uh, we only have time for one more question, and that question is: um, Are there certain types of games or, or tasks that have been found to be significantly more effective than others, or any types to avoid in general? Yeah, so, uh, you know, look, I mean, there's always, you know, regional and, and local, you know, kind of challenges that you'll, you know, that, that you'll have to look at. Um, you know, the, the, the main ones that we've found are, I mean, again, uh, leaderboards are big, and I, I don't want to keep harping on it, but social media groups uh, are also very popular. And the reason uh, is that they're easy, okay? They don't cost a lot to implement. Um, you know, um, and they're they're and they and they're really focused on a specific challenge. And again, this comes back to what I said earlier. If you want to use gamification successfully to really motivate patient, you know, your users, your patients, uh, to make long-term change, you have to have a specific behavior in mind. Uh, and so, leaderboards are a big challenge. Myself, and again, maybe this this is more uh, of an expression of my own persona. I'm not big on badges. I'll be honest with you. I am uh, and, and a little bit. Uh, for me, you know, it, it is, you know, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, being able to, you know, being presented with, you know, a pathway of, you know, uh, a dozen articles and videos. On, and by the way, I, did, I was just diagnosed with diabetes uh, last year. Being presented with this, you know, um, pathway of a dozen videos and articles. Uh, um, article you know, for me to, to review to learn more about my diabetes it was a, it was actually a big motivator because then yes I did get a badge but it was for an achievement and not just for a status uh, that was a big big element for me and there is I do have a philanthropist spirit too and it kind of you know I do like to get involved um, with groups and um, and try to help out and give my feedback and like I said too I'm also a disruptor. That's part of the reason why I've been in different, uh, I've been involved with various startups um, over the last uh, 20 years now. Um, and so that's what, what motivates me. But again, it, it kind of comes back to, you know, look at your own community, what works and what doesn't. 
I'll tell you not right now though, I do not, you know, and, and you may have caught this in my mention about healthy wage. I don't like the idea of giving out cash. I don't or, or cash and go. That's just it, it, it's the wrong motivator, uh, I think, for the long term for us. Now, I'm not going to say that it doesn't work. It can work. But I think, it, you know, you, you actually can, can have a negative backlash uh, on that. And also, it may be illegal in your, in your neck of the woods. So you got to be, be worried about that as well. Uh, I know in Wisconsin, where I'm at today, um, you know, they have very strict laws on, you know, organizations doing raffles, for example. <laughs> You know, you actually have to get a license just to, to do a raffle, um, you know, for uh, whether it's, you know, uh, for any organization get together. So anyway, that's, you know, hopefully that helps. But if you have any more questions, please feel free to email me, contact me. You know, I'm, a, kinda, this is, I'm very passionate about this and I would love to help you guys out, anybody, uh, help, help you folks out however I can. Uh, well, well, this is great, and unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, so, Ray, thank you so much. This was a, a wonderful presentation, and uh, as we close out here, I wanted to encourage you all, as Ray mentioned earlier in the presentation, to visit the um, the virtual exhibit booth at the VBC exhibit hall. Um, and uh, Ray, if you could go to that slide for me. There, there it is. Um, okay, so here what you can see is this is sort of what it looks like if you go and again uh, visit vbcexhibithall.com. Uh, they they have an exhibit booth there, and you can learn more about what they're doing and their team, and get some more information. So it's a fun way to connect, and and there's a lot of uh, a lot of archive materials there. And then finally, well, yeah, will, go ahead. sorry to interrupt, but I will post yeah. uh, our special offer to BBC uh, Exhibit Hall um, uh, subscribers and members on there probably this okay. afternoon <laughs> great yeah for sure yeah we'll we'll make sure to do that and i'll include something about that in the email i send to you guys uh oh, sure. afterwards as well so yeah thank you ray and that's that's a generous offer definitely encourage you guys to take advantage of it uh and then finally uh if you would like to reach out to ray uh here is his email you can contact him directly or if you'd like to reach out to me you can do that as well happy to put you in touch uh thank you all so much for coming i know you got a lot vying for your attention right now at this time uh but uh, we appreciate you uh you joining us hope you have a healthy and great rest of your week thank you for coming thank you everybody thanks garrett